So we're going to turn over to Samea, the national star, who comes from some Texas Tech. We've had a handful of students rotate with us from that uh, university, so glad to have her too. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jardine. Yes, uh, my name is Sam Ayer. I'm from Texas Tech, as he said, and um, I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you all so much for this opportunity and coming to listen to my presentation. I'm going to give a case presentation and a brief discussion on atropian uvea and secondary glaucoma. So this is a patient of Dr. Young seen at the Riverton Clinic. Um, she was a 10-year-old female referred by her PCP for ptosis in her right eye in January of 2017. Mom had some additional concerns that her right pupil looked slightly larger than the left and was a little off-centered. On examination, her visual acuity was appropriate for her age, eyes were well aligned. She did have mild ptosis in the right eye and um, some anisocoria, with the right pupil being slightly larger, but they both responded equally and appropriately to light. And um, of note at this initial visit was that her pressures were great and her cup to disc ratio was normal. So this is some photos of um, her eyes. You can see in her uh, the mild ptosis in the right eye and that the right pupil is slightly, slightly larger than the left. On this close-up image of her right pupil, you can see that there's some irregularity in the shape of the margin. And so she was subsequently diagnosed at that time with ectropian uvea and was closely followed up. Her next two follow-up visits were exactly the same, nothing had changed. However, in August of 2018, um, she did have elevated IOP in the right eye. Um, and her cup to disc ratio is now 0 0.6. Six months prior, it had uh, been 0 0.2, so it had changed quite significantly in a short amount of time. And she had no symptoms, uh, no visual changes that she was able to note. And this was when she was about two and a half years old, sorry. And so she was started on um, dorzolamide and Timolol, and um, all imaging done at that time was normal, and she came back to the clinic one week later, and uh, her pressure was back down to 10. Her next follow-up, no changes. Um, however, in January of 2019, when she was about three years old, the pressure had gone back up into the 30s in that right eye. And so latanoprost was added to her medical management, and Dr. Chayo was consulted for an EUA. On EUA, it confirmed that there was an elevated IOP and a cup to disc ratio. Um, but importantly, her anterior segment was open, and there was no signs of any obstruction on gonioscopy. A week later, she underwent a nasal goniotomy in that right eye, which was about six months ago from today, and um, her pressures have been great ever since. So what is ectropia nuvia? This is a condition where the posterior iris pigment epithelium is pushed anteriorly onto the surface of the iris, and these are some pictures here on the right that you could see, and that's what causes this irregular shape. Um, to the margin. So this can be congenital or acquired. There's a couple different theories about what causes the congenital variant. Um, the most common theory that I've read in the literature was some type of arrestment in the neural crest cell migration or development that um, uh, causes this um, hyperplasia. Another theory that's been postulated is that there's some type of primordial endothelium in the anterior segment that is not fully regress as it should, and that induces the hyperplasia of the epithelium and causes it to move anteriorly. Um, this is rare. I tried to find some epidemiological data on exact numbers. I unfortunately could not, but every article said that it was rare. And um, it's typically a unilateral finding. However, this can be um, bilateral as well. Most importantly, it's non-progressive. It should change over time. The uh, acquired version is going to be as a result of any ischemic or inflammatory process in the area that causes a membrane that then has traction on the pigment epithelium and pulls it anteriorly. And that's most commonly seen in neovascular glaucoma and neovascularization of the iris. Uh, the congenital atropian uvea can be an isolated finding, however, it's um, greatly associated with glaucoma, which I'll talk about in a minute. And also, um, in the literature I saw, it's associated with ptosis with good levator function, which I thought was very interesting because that's what our patient had as well. And the theory about that potentially is that Mueller's muscles of neural crest cell um, origin, and so it might nicely play into that theory. It is seen in a few systemic disorders, the most common being neurofibromatosis type 1. And so, um, talking about glaucoma specifically secondary to ectropia nuvia, an article that was published in July of 2018 um, did a literature review on the topic and found about 50 cases in uh, the literature about glaucoma specifically secondary to ectropia nuvia. And through their review, found that patients with this condition have an 80 to 90 percent chance of developing glaucoma at some point in their life. It's typically in childhood, but it was reported as early as seven months um, or well into the 40s. 
Um, so it's something to be very um, aware of. Patients with neurofibromatosis type 1 tend to have an angle closure glaucoma, while patients without that disorder um, tend to have an open angle glaucoma. But I did find one article that um, had angle closure glaucoma that did not have any signs of neurofibromatosis. The variation in the age presentation likely has to do with the degree of arrest of those neural crest cells or um, some type of um, anatomical change in the trabecular meshwork or the segment that um, predisposes these patients. I included these pictures because I'm a very visual learner and just wanted to understand the anatomy as well as I can. Um, I like to hear, I don't know if you can see this yet. So um, patients with uh, atropia and uvia uh, typically have an anterior insertion of their iris. It's usually at level B when you're looking at the Schaefer lines, and that's at the level of the trabecular meshwork. Some ports um, cated, uh, I'm sorry, reported as uh, anterior as A, which is um, Schwabi's line. So looking at this, um, you can see how if this is more anterior, how it would predispose these patients to um, developing glaucoma in their life. So there is no consensus as to what is the best treatment for this condition. Um, surgery is ultimately needed in every case to control their pressures. Interestingly, um, a few articles I read said that goniotomy and trabeculotomy are not, uh, may not be as effective for long-term control, which is interesting because of how effective it is in primary congenital glaucoma. Um, our patient did receive a goniotomy, and she's been doing fantastically. So I think this brings up um, two important cases, or two important points that, number one, we uh, should monitor her closely for the rest of her life, just in case her pressures do go back up and we need to um, appropriately treat her at that time. And number two, if her pressures do remain stable after the goniotomy, why is that? What's different about her case? What's different about her anatomy? And what can we learn more about this rare condition and how to treat it? So it's very exciting for the future. Um, according to the literature as of right now, it seems that trabeculectomy with mitomycin C is the most successful procedure at controlling these pressures long term. So in conclusion, um, or atropia nubia can be congenital or acquired, so you can see it at typically any age presentation, and it's something to be aware of with, due to the high association with glaucoma. And um, these patients should be regularly followed as often as uh, they can. And I think our patient was very blessed to have Dr. Young as her physician treating her because we were able to catch her elevated pressure um, and treat her when, uh, and provide intervention before she had any visual symptoms. Um, as of right now, goniotomies may not provide the best long-term control, but we still have so much to learn about this topic and um, could potentially contribute to the literature in the future. And I wanted to date, thank Dr. Young and Dr. Chaya for allowing me to talk about this patient. My references. Thank you.